Hello, and welcome to the Sentinel Innovation and Method Seminar Series. My name is Rishi Desai from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and I'll be moderating today's session. The US FDA Sentinel system helps to address questions related to safety and effectiveness of marketed medical products. The Sentinel Innovation Center focusing, focuses on developing innovative methods to further advance Sentinel by leveraging new data sources, building new tools, and enhancing real-world evidence capabilities. Sentinel Operation Center's focuses on supporting the FDA in the use of Sentinel Common Data Model and associated module programs. The Sentinel Operation Center also maintains the FDA's Active Risk Identification Analysis, or ARIA system. We launched this webinar series to engage experts and innovators in key areas related to the Innovation Center's master plan. With that, I'm very pleased to announce today's speaker, Dr. Yannick weber -Pass. Dr. weber -Pass is an in instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School and associate scientist in the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics at Brigham and Women's Hospital. His research focuses on the comparative effectiveness and safety of cancer therapies and the development and application of novel methods to improve causal inference from highly integrated clinical data dimensions. His most recent projects, centered around missing data approaches in EHRs, prognostics course in oncology, and applications of machine learning and deep learning networks to improve confounding control in comparative effectiveness research. Prior to joining Brigham and Women's Hospital, he worked as a real-world data scientist in early and late-stage research and development at Roche Pharmaceuticals in Germany and Switzerland. He holds a pharmacy degree from Philips University in Marburg, Germany, He's a board certified as a specialist pharmacist in drug information and holds a PhD in epidemiology from University of Heidelberg in Germany. The title of his presentation today is Deep Learning on Electronic Health Records for Research in Pharmacoepidemiology, Examples from the Field of Oncology. As you may imagine, this is an area of high interest to us especially in the Innovation Center, but more generally also in the field of pharmacoepidemiology as we develop more and more uh, capabilities for, for large-scale data analysis. We want to uh, leverage more machine learning tools to, to, um, to improve our ability to improve inference from these types of analysis. So uh, very excited to welcome Yannick. Before we get started, I would like to mention that your lines are muted. If you'd like to pose a question, please type it into Zoom question and answer feature. We will answer all the questions at the end of the session. And finally, this session is being recorded and will be made available through our website, which is sentinelinitiative.org. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Weber Pals. Uh, and again, thank him for joining us uh, uh, for this session today. Yeah, thank you very much, Rishi. Thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me um, the opportunity to present today. It's a great pleasure to be here um, and uh, talk about uh, the essentially the research that I've done during my postdoc. Uh, I want to start with some disclosures. I'm a former employee of uh, Roche and I held shares in Roche. And essentially all of the research that you see in this presentation was conducted during my postdoctoral fellowship, which was uh, funded by Roche. But all of the... Um, the um, topics and all of the studies that are covered in this presentation are published and are publicly um, accessible. Um, so I want to start with um, when we refer to AI, um, this isn't actually something uh, that is completely new or new development um, and had actually its beginning already in the 1950s um, under different names such as, you know, cognitive science or, or um, other terminologies. Um, and it was just in the last couple of decades that the classical way of machine learning, like with um, support vector machines, tree-based models, and so on, became much uh, more and more prevalent as also data and computational power became uh, much more available. Um, and we've seen great improvements, for example, on, on structured data with a classical machine learning methods. However, these models did not work well on complex types um, of data, such as images, on, on language, or some higher dimensional genomic data. And these were then really the areas where we have witnessed uh, big success stories um, in terms of uh, using deep learning and neural networks. If you think, for example, of advances in medical sciences, such as um, image recognition, or to just recently published um, AlphaFold, 
And so um, with all having all of that in mind, the uh, objectives essentially during my postdoc and with all of these projects were uh, to uh, kind of leverage um, those more novel and complex models uh, to apply them to causal inference, making causal predictions um, and using uh, electronic health records. And my presentation is essentially structured in two sections. In the first section, um, I wanna address how um, we applied machine learning, deep, deep learning uh, to electronic health records in order to make uh, kind of causal prognostic models uh, for the use um, in the end of comparative effectiveness and safety research. And then in the second part, I wanna swap a bit to the application of deep learning to improve uh, causal inference in the field of pharmacoepidemiology. Um, and I want to start with uh, prognostic models. Um, and I want to emphasize why prognostic models are um, especially important in the field of oncology, which is kind of the um, disease area that I'm most interested in. Uh, and that is because uh, they are highly used in clinical decision making, such as, for example, treatment decision making. Uh, NCCN guidelines partly rely on. Uh, risk models. And if you read, for example, uh, in an exclusion criteria in uh, protocols for clinical trials, uh, you often read in oncological cl clinical trials that um, a patient should have a physician assessed expected survival of um, X amount of time. Uh, and so prognostic models are really fundamental for clinical drug development, basic research, but are also methodologically interesting. If you think, for example, of disease risk scores or propensity scores, something that I want to touch on later. Uh, and after all, it's also uh, important to uh, communicate um, patients uh, in terms of prognosis and give them uh, the most transparent uh, information um, available. And so historically in oncology, t uh, TNM staging, uh, was used or was the, mo the most important information in, in order to um, kind of give an idea about the prognosis of um, a cancer patient based on the tumor size, the nodal lymph involvement, uh, and the metastatic status. But um, this is more and more changing in the era of precision oncology. If you think about um, biomarkers, digital pathology, or even um, what we've witnessed in the last couple of years, like tumor agnostic approvals, for example, on um, rare biomarker setups such as microsatellite high uh, tumors. Um, and so the main motivation for improved prognostic scores were manifold. Uh, most over, um, there were some prognostic models available, such as the Royal Mars and Hospital Score or the International Prognostic Index or the Classical Prognostic Score, but these are relatively outdated. Um, these and um, in addition to that, there was an increase in access to more data and as I already mentioned, uh, computational power. Now, on top of that, FDA also emphasized in their guidance from March 2019 that enrichment uh, strategies aiming to increase the probability of treatment success in investigational studies uh, is one, um, one of the areas that, um, that uh, they want to specifically highlight, for example, by decreasing intrapatient variability, identifying patients with characteristics that would make completing the treatment period um, unlikely, and identifying those who are unlikely to tolerate and or benefit from the drug to really have um, a better uh, kind of enrichment and um, idea which um, patients to include or exclude into uh, clinical trials. And this is also mostly supported then with prognostic and uh, predictive scores. And so the first, um, the first project that we came up with was then published in the Annals of Oncology in 2020, um, where we looked in, or where we had developed um, a pantheon of prognostic score for uh, overall survival. And so this first project was really just a, a relatively common Cox regression based approach uh, to benchmark against future projects, which will I, I will then uh, talk about in, in just a second. Um, and then for the development of the prognostic score in uh, this project, but also for all of the other analyses included in this presentation, uh, we used the nationwide uh, Flatiron Health HR-derived uh, identified uh, database. 
Um, and this database includes uh, data from over 280 cancer clinics, including more than 2.2 million US cancer patients available for analysis. And um, the database has the NFN the identified patient level data and the EHRs, including structured data, for example, lab measurements or prescribed drugs, in addition to um, unstructured data collected via technology enabled chart abstraction from physician notes or other unstructured documents, such as, for example, pathology reports and biomarker reports, as well as outcome data. Um, and so for this specific study, we uh, selected patients out of uh, 17 tumor specific databases and pulled them into a single cohort. Um, just to get the, the study design um, ahead of the modeling, um, patients were eligible to be included if they were diagnosed with a primary tumor of any of the 17 uh, tumor types that were uh, included or that we had access um, um, uh, at that time, and that received a first-line systemic uh, anti-cancer treatment. And the start of the first-line treatment um, was then also defined as the patient's index date, and we followed then the patients from that point in time until the event, which was defined as, the, as death due to any reason, so overall survival, or to the censoring date. Um, Time-dependent covariates were measured in 30-day window before the index date. And if there were multiple measurements um, available, for example, a multiple hemoglobin or albumin labs, um, we selected uh, the latest one. So patients without any line of treatment were uh, excluded as we really wanted to focus on uh, treated patients um, in this project because um, we had several applications in mind, uh, first and foremost, like clinical development and um, patient enrichment strategies as uh, lined out before. Um, and if patients were present with a significant amount of missing data, they were um, excluded. And for the remaining patients, we performed in a stratified uh, imputation by cancer type using non-parametric imputation models. Um, so we had the, this uh, relatively large uh, cohort of over than 100,000 patients and to select the most prognostic covariates out of approximately 99 covariates overlapping across um, all cohorts, we used uh, two approaches. Um, we defined our main approach as a backward selection um, with family voice error rate control. Uh, for, that, for this, we iteratively iteratively remove the variable with uh, the least impact on model performance until all remaining parameters yielded um, a measurable improvement in concordance index, the C index, uh, and generalized R square and were significant um, at an alpha um, equals uh, 5% um, significance level. Uh, we also used uh, a lasso-based approach as a secondary analysis, um, including also cross-validation. And with um, the LASU model, LASU uses penalization of covariates to a degree that it shrinks coefficients to zero and hence automatically provides um, a covariate selection. Um, and with uh, both models, we arrived at approximately um, 27 uh, covariates. So we had 28 covariates in the LASU model, um, 27 in the backward selection approach. Um, and when we looked at the overlap of the um, kind of automatically selected covariates, uh, 26 of them uh, coincided, uh, which was really reassuring. But for the remainder of uh, the slides for this project, I refer to the 27 covariates that we selected in the backward selection approach, since this was our primary model. Um, and then the, the final uh, prognostic score model that we termed real world prognostic score or ROPRO. Um, for this, we this, this was essentially specified as the weighted sum of the patient's differences from the respective reference, um, uh, reference means of uh, each variable. And so the, the row pro is essentially a continuous score that you can interpret in a way that the higher the row pro score is, um, the higher is also the hazard for uh, the event. Um, and as you can see in, in this chart, uh, these are the resulting 27 very prognostic uh, variables um, that remained after our comprehensive co um, covariate selection. And we tried to um, kind of illustrate which um, variables had the biggest impact or the biggest weight uh, in our model. And you will not be surprised that you feel, find um, um, covariates that you may have also chosen based on, on clinical judgment. 
Um, and so in terms of the results, this Kaplan-Meier curve shows the survival stratified by rogue pro-percentiles. Um, and as you can see, it leads to a very clear and clean separation of the curves by the rogue pro-percentile. And this may, um, again, emphasize its uh, prognostic availability. Um, and to compare it and kind of um, assess the performance of the RoPro, we compared it against the Royal Marsden Hospital uh, score as one of the more established scores um, and also validated um, the score in two independent clinical trial data sets. One was a smaller phase one trial and one was a larger phase three trial, which was the, the OAK trial. Uh, and the main performance measure for the comparison that we did with uh, Royal Marsden Hospital Index score and the validation was Harold C Index, which is kind of a measure um, which, which measures the agreement uh, between the prognostic score uh, and the time until an event um, happens in, in the survival analysis. Um, and the higher um, the, prognostic, uh, the, the C index is the more prognostic, um, the model uh, is, is performing with 0 0.5, uh, giving more or less a, a random um, prediction. Um, and as I mentioned, we use C index as the primary um, performance measure uh, in, in this study. And as you can see from the development data set, uh, the table on the left-hand side, um, the ROPRO CNX um, greatly outperformed the Royal Marsden Hospital Index, not only um, with the C index as a measure, measurement performance um, uh, scale, but also, for example, when we uh, looked at the AUC uh, at three months survival or at the AUC at a one year survival. On the right hand side, you can see the corresponding uh, AUC curves for the validation set in the clinical trials. Um, and as you can then also here see from the AUC, the ROPRO had a much higher prognostic ability than um, the Royal Marsden Hospital Index score. Um, and now I want to come to the actual topic that I wanted to talk about today, which is um, actually the million dollar question. Can we boost the prognostic performance of such models using more complex machine learning um, and deep learning models? And here, one of the reasonings could be that um, modeling more complex uh, interactions or moments in, in, in the data um, could be much more easily done uh, with more complex models. If you think about, for example, interactions or, or nonlinear and this is essentially what we did then in, in a follow-up project where I had the opportunity to um, supervise a PhD student, Hugo Guerrero, who uh, carried out this, this analysis uh, or this very comprehensive analysis where we used the RoPro as a baseline model and compared it to much more complex models, which uh, you can see here. Uh, in general, we compared um, the RoPro uh, against a regular rec uh, Cox model pro, so um, as I already mentioned, um, the LS we, we used TLSU, Elastic Net, um, and Rich, where a regularization term is added to um, the, the cost function of the Cox model. We also looked at a um, survival specific modification of the gradient boosting algorithm, where we used uh, Cox partial likelihood as the, Cox, uh, as the cost function to determine uh, the residuals um, in, in the algorithm. Um, we also used a random survival forest model, which consists of regression trees or forests that estimate the cumulative hazard function. Um, and at each tree node, a covariate is used to separate the patients into groups. And the random survival forest essentially selects uh, the split condition that maximizes the difference between the survival curves of the groups. Um, and then we also looked at um, a more recently published um, uh, neural network, uh, which was called DeepSurf, which is a feed-forward neural network with um, uh, Cox regression as a partial hazard loss function as the, as the final layer. Um, and uh, lastly, we were also looking at some unsupervised um, algorithm uh, based on uh, autoencoders, which are also unsupervised neural networks, um, but those I will uh, talk a bit uh, in, in more depth later. Uh, and in addition, we extended also the super learner framework to survival analysis problem um, and used it to uh, aggregate uh, all of the um, previously mentioned um, models into kind of an ensemble model that combines the predictions of all models yielding um, a new weighted prediction towards the C index as the target parameter. And the setup was 
uh, essentially um, the same as with um, the road pro study that I just presented. We developed um, all of those models in the flat iron database and then validated them in uh, the oak data set. Um, and to evaluate how much of a difference uh, it makes on how many covariates we uh, fed into the models, we used essentially three different uh, covariate sets as predictors. Um, but in the end, that didn't make such of a difference. So um, uh, I'm, I'm just reporting here the results for the set of uh, 44 covariates. And when we look at the performance of uh, the different models in um, the flat iron health test set, we could see uh, a meaningfully improved um, prognostic ability using, for example, the deep surf network, but also the tree based models uh, performed really, really well, with uh, the best performing model uh, being the super learner, which is uh, kind of not surprising. Um, however, um, results were a bit more sobering when we then validated those findings um, in the validation data set, uh, where um, the difference in prognostic ability was not really significantly higher, even with the super learner approach uh, compared to the Rope Pro uh, benchmark. Uh, and this essentially led us uh, to conclude that um, in this exercise, complex machine learning models did not really meaningfully increase the performance of prognostic scores in oncology. We There were actually also some um, observations um, made in, in uh, other disease areas that were similar to our findings. Um, and reasons could be, of course, manifold. Uh, one of the things that we discussed, for example, in the paper is um, the, the covariates used for uh, the predictions are maybe still limited if you think about the wealth of information that you have, for example, in, in, uh, in images or in uh, speech language, um, but could be due to uh, uh, several reasons. But I think further exploration um, is, is um, also uh, a very interesting field of study. Um, now I want to uh, shift gears a bit and come from causal prognostic models to causal inference, which is essentially at the heart of what every pharmacoepidemiologist does. And here the motivation or the motivating example was really to um, see if we can use more complex models such as deep learning models to improve uh, covariate balancing when doing comparative effectiveness studies. And at that time, I was especially interested in, for example, um, if we can improve covariate balance in, for example, external control arms. Um, and so if you think about the concept of comparative effectiveness studies or um, observational studies, we may acknowledge that there may be systematic differences in the baseline characteristics between patients who receive a certain drug A versus B. Uh, and that's why we as pharmacoepidemiologists love so much propensity scores, because in propensity score theory, um, uh, propensity scores are essentially the conditional probability then that an individual receives a certain treatment based on observed baseline characteristics. And then causal inference theory tells us that by conditioning uh, on, on those, uh, for example, by matching or weighting, the two cohorts um, uh, will be balanced in a way that the only difference uh, is the treatment. And so as with all statistical models, also propensity scores come with assumptions uh, which determine the validity of the results. Uh, one of the major um, assumptions for propensity scores is that there's no unmeasured confounding, which is often difficult to assess uh, or test, but there have been uh, potential solutions proposed, such as, for example, high dimensional propensity scores, uh, IV analyses, um, or uh, active comparator designs, um, and of course, also sensitivity analysis that give you an idea how much damage and confounding needs to be uh, in order to change conclusions. Um, but the second one uh, that I want to actually point out is propensity score models have to be correctly specified. And, and with that, I mean uh, that uh, there needs to be uh, a proper variable selection process uh, that can happen, for example, by uh, a priori by investigator defined variables such as um, based on, on literature or expert knowledge. Um, and more importantly, predictors need to be um, highly associated with the treatment and the outcome, which would be then the typical confounders. Um, or uh, especially in the field of oncology, I would say predictors of the outcome are probably even more important to select for propensity score models. <clears throat> 
Um, and something that is often forgotten, uh, but is um, actually also one of the um, main assumptions of propensity scores is that nonlinearities and non-additivities need to be considered. And again, here also for causal inference, maybe more complex models, which um, kind of implicitly model, model those um, higher order moments, um, may have um, a benefit as compared to uh, less complex regression-based models. And the idea here be behind the deep learning uh, based propensity score was to use um, autoencoders. And autoencoders are unsupervised uh, deep learning architectures that are heavily used as a pre uh, pre-training method in uh, especially computer vision. So if you take um, a picture of a cat, uh, this uh, picture consists of single pixels and you can define those pixels as one dimensional input vector into a deep neural network. Now, autoencoders work by sequentially compressing uh, this information, for example, via uh, hidden layers that have a lower uh, dimension than the input into what is called the bottleneck layer. This is essentially um, the deep, um, the neural net, the, the neural network layer that has the biggest compression in the entire uh, neural network. And now you can use this embedding or this lower dimensional representation of the input data to predict your um, input or to reconstruct your input. Uh, and this is how you essentially train um, the deep neural network by doing this iteratively over many, many uh, data sets. And by doing so, the neural network learns its parameters such as the weights and biases um, and, and learn structures that are very distinct um, and that are very important for the reconstruction of this picture, such as, for example, in this cat picture, it would be the eye or the nose or the ear, which are very distinct features um, of, of uh, the cat picture. Now, the idea was that we could essentially apply the same, uh, not to cat pictures, but to actual um, patient data coming from electronic health records, where one node doesn't stand for um, a single pixel, but for patient covariates, such as uh, demographic variables, such as age, uh, the sex, the treatment history, and so on. And then we um, apply the same uh, method um, with uh, the electronic health records to train uh, an embedding and this embedding could be then used as an input into a logistic regression, which would then um, eventually um, give us the propensity score. And this is essentially what we did, uh, again, with a pretty, pretty similar um, setup as we've already done for the prognostic model. So we had a rather um, inclusive cohort. So we only excluded patients who did not get uh, first line treatment or those who had really implausible or missing follow-up information, uh, which we couldn't do uh, so much about. Um, and then again, the covariates were either measured at baseline, which was the index date, or um, in the uh, 90 days before in terms of time dependent uh, covariates. And we um, uh, result, and this resulted in around 128,000 patients that we used then to train the autoencoder. Um, and it's good practice when reporting um, deep neural networks to talk about how we arrived at the hyperparameters and how we um, tuned them. And one of probably the most important hyperparameters, the, the learning rate. And you can, you can imagine that like playing golf. Um, a neural network tries to find a, a local minima um, based on differential equations. Um, and finding this minima, um, minimum, uh, we can um, apply or we can um, adapt our learning rate in, um, in uh, bigger chunks or in, in smaller chunks. Um, and you can imagine that like playing golf. So in the, in the beginning, you want to hit the ball hard to get approximately to, um, to, to uh, the, the, the hole. Um, and in the end, you want to do this in a more precise way by putting uh, more gently. And this is essentially also how, how those learning rates um, uh, work. And uh, something that um, has become uh, best practice is to have adaptive learning rates. So really start uh, by going bigger steps and then small steps in, in the end. Um, in terms of activation functions, we used uh, rectified linear units for the encoding part and sigmoid functions, which are essentially inverse logistic models for the decoding part. 
Um, we, as a loss function, we use binary cross entropy and we added some noise and model checkpoint uh, callbacks, which are common measures in neural networks in order to um, avoid overfitting. The um, file amount of hidden layers and the bottleneck layer size was then uh, determined via a grid search that you can see here. So essentially we wanted to find the best trade-off between the reconstruction error and model parsimony and, and compactness here. Now, in order to evaluate how well such an auto encoder um, can, uh, uh, or can, con can contribute to confounding control, we set up um, a simulation, uh, again, with approximately 128,000 uh, first line treated cancer patients. We randomly assigned um, a drug A uh, versus a drug B treatment, which means this uh, treatment was not as associated with any of the variables, meaning we had a true hazard ratio of one. Now, what we what we did to um, kind of um, synthetically introduce bias was that uh, for uh, the drug A patient arm, we just randomly sampled 10,000 patients. For the drug B uh, patient arm, we conditionally sampled based on um, a prognostic score. And here we used the ROPRO that I just introduced earlier in uh, this presentation to induce some kind of artificial imbalance uh, based on condi conditionally sampling patients with different risk quartiles of the control group. Um, and this resulted in uh, around 27 different and uh, sampling scenarios that we considered. So um, again, for transparency, um, for example, the first scenario that we um, that we used in the very left-hand corner on the bottom, uh, where you can see 40, 30, 20, 10. So these numbers stand for um, the proportion of patients that we sample from the different um, prognostic score quartiles. Um, and with the 27 different sampling scenarios, we had then scenarios that were biased more in favor of drug B. Uh, and also bias more in favor of drug A. And um, the sampling scenarios where um, the drug B patients were sampled equally across, um, across the uh, prognostic score quartiles then ended up in, in the true null model. Um, and in order to um, compare um, the performance with um, other um, propensity score approaches, uh, maybe also data-driven covariate selection approaches. Um, we measured the performance as um, the standardized mean difference, meaning the balancing uh, that the propensity that we achieved using the propensity score with the different methods, the um, the mean squared error, the percent bias, and the confidence interval interval coverage uh, in terms of the difference of um, the resulting um, hazard ratio estimates as compared to the true estimate, which was a hazard ratio of one. And the, uh, as already mentioned, we compared our autoencode approach to other different uh, adjustment strategies. So first of all, an unadjusted strategy to get uh, kind of an, uh, an idea um, what the unadjusted estimate would have been. Uh, and then we used uh, conventional multivariable regression model with some a priori defined uh, covariates that we considered important from uh, an empirical point of view. Um, and then also we compared approaches such as LASU or PCA. Uh, and we additionally added models where we um, um, derived empirical covariates based on the amount of lab tests that have been performed in the 90 days uh, before um, the index state, which is kind of equivalent to the higher dimension propensity score applied to electronic health records. But of course, we did not have that much information as we would have had in claims to derive empirical covariates in our database. Um, in terms of the simulation results, you can see here the balancing that was achieved using the different propensity score models. Um, and per covariate, you see um, the um, many of these dots and uh, they stand for the different um, uh, simulated uh, scenarios. So overall, um, Lasso performed very well in keeping the uh, cohort balanced, but also autoencoder here uh, performed uh, quite well. Uh, in terms of confounding adjustment, and this is the, the really interesting results here, um, we saw that the autoencoders performed well, they performed okay, 
um, but not significantly better um, than other established approaches such as uh, Lesue in this case. Um, and this is again the same results uh, just shown by scenario and here the asterisk um, uh, we assigned if the 95% confidence interval included the true hazard ratio in at least 95 out of 100 iterations that we did for um, the simulation. And in order to illustrate the application of the autoencoder-derived propensity score, we emulated uh, the pronounced trial. The pronounced trial was uh, published in 2015. It was a randomized open label phase three trial uh, in non-small cell lung cancer patients in a first line setting. And the interventions that were compared here were um, uh, two uh, classical chemotherapy regimens um, and the pronounced trial arrived at a hazard ratio of uh, around one. So it did not um, suggest that there's any benefit for either of the treatments. Um, and we adapted this um, trial using the target trial approach by um, Hernan and Robbins. Um, and you can essentially see here uh, all of the different protocol elements that we try to emulate and how we try to emulate them, the treatment um, strategies that we assigned, um, and the causal contrast of interest, which were in uh, the target trial emulation case, the counterfactual comparison of the initiators of the two different treatment strategies, which is the observation equivalent to the intention to treat analysis. Um, in terms of um, looking at this target trial uh, approach, the results were clustered uh, around the expected results independent of which propensity score model we used. So qualitative, qualitatively, uh, all uh, scenarios or all propensity scores led to the same conclusion. Uh, although we did see a trend towards increasing hazard ratios with um, the more adjusted models as compared to the um, unadjusted models. Um, and we think that we received um, such uniform results irrespective of the approach by having actually emulated the target trial very well in terms of the N and exclusion criteria, um, as we were also able to, for example, uh, include in an exclusion criteria based on biomarkers uh, and other things, and that um, actually emulated the trial already quite well, and probably there was not so much um, confounding bias present in the data anymore. Um, and so before I conclude, um, I wanted to just point out in both of uh, the cases, meaning causal prognostic models, but also causal inference models, we realized that uh, deep learning models and more complex models, they work, but they did in our cases not substantially better than established models. Um, and I think when you look at the literature, this becomes more and more apparent uh, based on, on what is published. And I just brought here one example that was just very recently published, which uh, also states that free based models still are the kind of the uh, state of the art um, machine learning models when it comes to structured or like tabular data uh, as compared to deep learning models. Um, and so given time and resources, one should maybe consider if it's worthwhile tuning the neural networks, which can be very fitly for tabular data versus using a more tree-based approach or penalized regression models, which also work very well in, in our cases. But there may be, of course, situations that, that are different from our regular use cases where we have, for example, covariates just measured at one point in time as compared to, for example, when we have uh, time series data where deep learning models um, or more complex models could actually make uh, sense again. Or if we want to actually enrich our tabular data with um, other data types such as images or language models, or maybe also single cell sequencing data that we could not analyze um, otherwise using, for example, a simple regression models. And so I think um, there's still a very interesting future ahead of um, doing research on how to um, best leverage um, those more complex deep learning uh, models, for example, using a multimodal database approach for data enrichment, or maybe also to optimize um, loss functions in deep learning to target causal inference questions such as optimize towards cohort balancing or doubly robust models. Um, and I want, I want to end here um, to have enough time for Q&A. Uh, and I just want to point out, as I mentioned before, this uh, everything has been published. The papers can be found uh, under this link that I posted here. Uh, and you can actually also um, access uh, the code that we used for the different 
um, studies under the given uh, hyperlinks here. And if you have any questions, these uh, are my uh, contact data. Great, thank you, Yannick. That was a, an excellent overview of some of these deep learning type models in um, in applications for risk prediction as well as propensity scores. And uh, I just would like to remind folks that the floor is now open for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them in the Zoom question and answer uh, feature so we can read them out and uh, uh, and uh, and ask our expert here. So. There is one question, Yannick, uh, asked by an anonymous attendee, uh, suggesting that your finding, which uh, indicates machine learning models have limited uh, improvement in prediction over standard methods, uh, which is seen and replicated across many settings. Now, um, given that some of these ML methods have also high risk of bias with ProBast, uh, what can we do? to increase return on investment for these methods. Yeah, so so first of all, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I, I'm, I'm not very familiar with uh, what ProBust um, actually means, um, but uh, I agree. I think the, the application of, of machine learning um, has, to, has to come also with a causal study design in mind. Uh, and I think that's, that's probably the first and foremost approach to, to avoid a, a bias. For example, if you introduce um, immortal time bias or other biases which come, which come with study design, also machine learning model will not be able to, to, to rescue um, to, to, to rescue your, your estimates that you will be getting in, in the end. And so for me, machine learning models are more like an enhancement to um, the, the core foundations that we have built in epidemiology rather than, um, uh, rather than a kind of um, uh, putting or leaving everything overboard uh, and just go with the, with the pure modeling. Thank you. And Probast is, I think, just a risk of bias tool for prediction modeling papers. Oh. Right. So, okay. Okay, excellent. So uh, as folks think of other questions, I can probably start with one or two of my own. So one question that I had for you uh, is around the computation uh, requirement as well as the computation timing with some of these newer uh, deep learning type approaches. Uh, in terms of your um, experience while doing these simulations, what is uh, your uh, take on that? How how much additional, if if any, uh, resources are required, both in terms of time is and in terms of uh, computation power, uh, compared to some of these uh, some of these standard approaches like a lasso, for example. Yeah, um, and I guess I've I've already touched a bit uh, on on that a bit um, during my conclusion slides. So there's actually two two aspects to those uh, deep neural networks. So uh, first of all, you have to iterate many times until you get like um, a model and the hyperparameters that um, are are um, that. Um, have to be tuned because as compared to more classical machine learning or regression based models of course there's much more that you that you need to consider in order to uh, get very stable models um, and then there's of course also the computational part i was in the uh, fortunate situation that i had quite a lot of computational power and gpus available so the computational uh, setup here um, was uh, optimal, but still it took a lot of time uh, to, to tune the models and to reiterate. Um, and uh, for me, for a regular like target trial emulation would have probably been not worth, although the deep neural, deep neural networks uh, tended to, to show the same results as for example, LSU. Um, but again, of course, there's an increase in uh, resources and in time and uh, computationally um uh investments that have to be made thank you uh and there are questions coming in so i appreciate uh, the engagement from the audience so one of the uh questions uh, is around a clarification on how you assign people to drugs a or b in your uh, in your causal inference um simulations yeah this was essentially just um a way of um simulating an exposure so we did not take a real exposure we just simulated one and we just randomly um assigned um, uh, um essentially a zero and a one to patients for being treated with drug a versus drug b as you would also find it in a comparative effectiveness uh study 
Um, and of course, by doing this randomly, uh, it, it's not associated, associated with any variable and it leads to a true hazard ratio. Um, and, but we did the kind of uh, introduction of the bias with the conditional sampling of just one of the arms. So just the drug B arm based on the prognostic scores. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Uh, there is one more question from, from Professor Sneeweiss. Uh, he is wondering uh, as the pre-exposure pre feature space is getting bigger and bigger by funneling some free text free text information into an adjustment system. Do you think that this is has the potential for uh, observing more benefits uh, from some of these autoencoder-based methods versus uh, versus the traditional lasso-based methods? Yeah, this is like exactly where I wanted to go, like with my last slide. Um, so in, in, in my vision, I think this is a very uh, interesting question to uh, think about. If we take, for example, like uh, data such as lang language or unstructured nodes or medical images, uh, and then uh, classical supervised models would, again, need a lot of annotating and tuning and so on. But going for, for example, an uh, unsupervised um, approach by learning and embedding, which has been done also in the past, for example, um, you may you may know the word to vac um, uh, adaptions of essentially learning um, language representations. Um, this can be a very promising way of en enriching the data sets that we have. Um, this is essentially what I meant with one of the last bullet points to uh, use deep learning more as tools to enrich our data sets um, and getting uh, those those richer pre-exposure information rather than to use it for the pure modeling. Uh, and I think there's um, there's uh, quite some quite some uh, interesting research, research that still has to be done. So Yannick, I have a follow-up question on this. So uh, in your simulation setup, I think the number of uh, confounders that you consider was uh, rather modest uh, in the 100, I think 120 or something like that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, do you also feel that your results would be very similar if you increase the dimension of the data, meaning more pre-exposure variables to, let's say, thousands, for example? Uh, in that case, do you think that these types of methods have advantages over, over lasso or, or other approaches? Yeah, I think the, the the caveat with those more complex models, such as deep learning models, is that still, even if we had more covariates um, that we would derive, then for example, using a claims linkage, the data would still be sparse. And um, deep learning or deep learning networks um, have been proven to not very to work very well with uh, sparse data. So they really need some some rich data sets, such such as images and. Um, and have continuous data, such as, for example, lab measurements is something that we saw improve the confound control a lot by actually including the, the standardized value. Um, and so this is more the type of data where I think um, neural networks could make a difference rather than sparse um, binary data. And when you say sparse, just to clarify, you mean uh, lower prevalence? Data. Yeah, lower prevalence data. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. There is one more question that just came in is uh, around uh, methods. So, uh, so is there any method to, to decide the required training and validation size in a machine learning approach? Um, the, there, um, I mean, essentially what, what we did, for example, in, in our case, uh, in terms of uh, the training and validation size is, um, there's not like a real, um, rule, but I think general wisdom is that one should split, for example, uh, the training data set into 80% training, 20% testing. We were, again, in the fortunate um, situation that we had quite um, a lot of observations. So the 20% testing data set was still uh, quite a number of, of patients. Uh, in terms of the validation size, it's probably also depending on what data you get access to. Uh, and I think this is probably the more limiting question. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and just maybe one more question to wrap it up. Have you seen any promising real life uh, examples of applied studies where some of these methods have been used for confounding adjustment purposes and where you thought that it uh, it made sense and it perhaps made a difference? Um, to be honest, not really. And I think this is why um, also the the exam or the this kind of uh, field of enriching uh, the the information that we have uh, available at baseline is so is so interesting because um, 
we, we as pharmacoepidemiologists, or like um, someone who, who has these causal uh, study designs in, in, in mind, um, we may uh, be very well leveraging uh, these um, uh, information to, to enrich our data set rather than modeling. So what has been done, for example, by, by groups like, like Google and so on is to really have these kind of time series data. And I think this is also a very interesting uh, other application um, since um, with the um, involvement of transformer models, which are kind of um, 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 more, more recent attention-based models. And those have seen very, very good results in, in, in unstructured data, which you can also see, see as kind of a sequence of, 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 um, of events happening. Uh, and those have really outperformed if you if you just think about those bird models or bird um, bird-based models that uh, are often used in natural language processing, which works so well um, out of just out of the box that um, that you really have a hard time tuning some of the older models such as convolutional neural networks in order to perform uh, the same way or recurrent neural networks uh, to perform the same way. And so I think this is a very exciting field in, in that sense. Okay, well, uh, there are no more questions on the chat box. I don't have any more questions of my own. So I think with this, we can probably conclude today's session and thank Yannick again for uh, Really an excellent presentation, an overview of some of these newer methods for confounding adjustment purposes. So th thank you, Yann, again, and I will see everybody around hopefully then for the next session, which is next week. So thanks. Thanks, Yannick. Thanks a lot for having me.